convention. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you must have had a good impression. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a while ago though I mean, that he left. Yeah, no. I haven't really been in contact with him very much uh, since. Yeah. Partly because we didn't have any papers to finish because yeah, yeah. that was all done, say, within a year after yeah. he left. Yeah. So I don't know about his, his recent whereabouts very much. Uh, Andrew Reid. Uh, yes. I talked to him. Yeah. I think he's a good source. Yeah, he, he also knows uh, that he's been a part of very quick word before Jurgen offers a proper introduction to us. Um, I met him first in Copenhagen, where it turns out he's the main person leading the charge for connecting evolutionary biology and medicine. Turns out to be even more challenging in Copenhagen than the other <coughs> places with all European roles and the like. But we had wonderful conversations, in particular, in his work on social insects and social evolution in general, strikes me as profoundly important for evolutionary biology in general, and especially for disease. And I also think this work really exemplifies the possibility that we're not just bringing evolutionary biology to doctors, but we're using studies of disease, especially in insects, to answer more fundamental problems in evolutionary biology in general. There are practical applications in medicine, just in case you're not aware of them, range from biofilms to try to understand human capacities for morality. Um, I've been an aficionado of merging West Everhart's approach to social evolution, and I've been working hard to try to bring that perspective to studies of humans. But that's quite a ways different from the things that we've been talking about today. Jurgen, I'll let you take it away for the specific introduction. Yeah, so I, um, I know Coast for quite a while. I think we met in a fun Finnish sauna in Farmene on an island after we discussed who should rescue the Hamilton because he was skating on the Baltic Sea, which nobody was allowed to do. But uh, in any case, he, he actually proved the table in the ants uh, wrong, where it was claimed that most ants are polyantric. Uh, at that time was right, but then so that's kind of where, where my PhD and his kind of work overlapped. We were both interested in how genetic diversity actually really influences conflicts in social organisms and social structures. And I think that's kind of where, where Kuz and I overlapped and we had a couple of discussions and, and there were things. And this morning I discovered that he hasn't quite read my PhD thoroughly. <laughs> 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 no, no, it's aging, you forget. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I'll send him, resend him my paper on that because uh, it may be up to some interesting. But he's a he's a great and a mentor. He has driven the social insect um, group in whole Europe. So he was uh, the instrumental for setting three or four European programs. Uh, two, okay, sorry, <laughs> two of the big European uh, programs on social insect. And I, I think we produced about 20, 30 postdocs, very successful, still kind of positions all over the country and so he has influenced I think great teal social insect researchers and I'm looking forward to your talk. And for those of you in the back there are a couple of seats <coughs> here and here if you'd like to have a good luck. Well thank you Randy and Jurgen for uh, your kind introduction. It's wonderful to be back here. Last time it was uh, when uh, Jurgen was organizing a meeting on how ant people could get into genomics. Well, that was apparently very successful because that's what we are now and that's what I'm not going to talk about even though I'm heavily involved in that. Um, it was only a few years later that Randy and I um, first met and that's been a wonderful journey to actually get into the evolutionary applications of, uh, of the sort of conflict stuff that we are interested in and see how you can use them for uh, making sense of some human diseases that nobody else can make sense of. So by accident I had that talk up uh, for a while that I gave a few days ago at the wonderful meeting that Randy organized to get everybody here that has an interest in medical applications of evolutionary theory. Um, but what I want to do today is take you back to the fundamentals of how we uh, understand social evolution. So it's going to be about these three things, about social insects, also about zygotes, and about obligate mutualisms. 
But I'd like to sort of set out with a very general introduction about conflict and cooperation. Because you meet that at every conceivable level in nature. So you can say start out with mating pairs. So it's obviously cooperative to make babies together, but it's not obvious who does most of the work. If you have strict monogamy, that tends to cooperate, uh, to promote cooperation, but if there's exit options that are real, then you may end up actually having not a lot of cooperation in raising the kids. So you can take that up to the level of the insect societies, or the cooperative breeders, birds, mammals, insects. There it's about raising siblings. But again, the interesting question comes for whose fitness benefits is that, and are all parties in agreement about doing that um, together and jointly and in a harmonious way, or are there conflicts? In the advanced use social insects, we have really altruistic commitments to a degree that we got physically differentiated workers who have lost their individuality to be altruists. But there's other forms, particularly in the cooperative breeders, where individuals can opt out and in and where it becomes a much more fluent and partially um, conflictuous uh, kind of thing. Final thing, take it one more level up. Um, think about the symbiosis that have become really important across the globe. I will talk a bit about um, fungus farms and how to run them at the end of the talk. Again, there's issues of strict partner commitment that tend to be very helpful to get almost organismal cooperation between two non-related partners. But you also have more promiscuous um, type of symbiosis like these root nodules see if I can get this on to work, these root nodule type <coughs> of things here in Rosobia, where there's just more than one bacterial strain in every nodule and where even though the cooperation functions fine, there are sort of traces and sometimes more than that of cheating and try to have free riding type of thing. Now, um, ever since I did my PhD, I've been inspired by William D. Hamilton's inclusive fitness uh, paradigm and that continues until the present day and basically much of this talk will be trying to simplify things in a way that to try and convince you that this really is the paradigm uh, that we have to understand social evolution. So Hamilton's rule captures the dynamics of the process that he identified for the first time that organisms appear to be designed not by a creator but by natural selection to maximize inclusive fitness. That boiled down to that simple rule that you see here and I've written it in the Alan <coughs> Graffin form which basically has this 0.5 here because what you need is the benefits multiplied by the relatedness to be bigger than the cost of foregone own offspring, but because you're related to that offspring by a half, you always need to scale that relatedness parameter with this factor of a half. So it's important that in its most general way, all these three key variables vary simultaneously, and so there's multiple solutions to actually get this inequality to be fulfilled when you may get reproductive altruism to evolve, or when it fails and you will not get it. It's also very crucial to understand that inclusive maximization is about the two components. It's either the standard Darwinian direct fitness, or it is indirect reproductive success to relatives, but inclusive fitness is the sum of these two. In some cases, it's mostly direct fitness. In other cases, in particular the advanced use social insects, it's only indirect reproductive success if workers are completely sterile. However, what hasn't been appreciated in the same manner is that there's a number of things that Hamilton's rule in its three variable <coughs> continuous varying type of guise, there's a number of things it cannot help you to explain. So what it cannot help explain is these three things. It cannot give you information about when it pay to evolve. Lifetime unmated caste that would be physically differentiated from the breeder caste. That's the social insects. 
Nita can it explain when multicellularity, which is a very similar kind of thing, actually should become obligate, or when it should be remain facultative. So obligate is us, animals, plants, fungi. Facultative is something like dictyostelium slime molds that have a phase in their life, they become multicellular, but otherwise they're just a movie. Neither does it explain if you can use Hamilton's rule for explaining mutualisms, and I will show you that we in fact can, when those would become obligate or when they would stay facultative. And what I'm going to argue is that strict lifetime commitments in the absolute most strict form that you can think of has the potential to resolve these. All three issues, actually. And that the reason is very simple, because if you have strict full sibling families, your relatedness to siblings is per definition equal to your relatedness to offspring, so these things cancel out of Hamilton's rule. And as I will try and persuade you of, I think it is only those kind of exact equality situations that ever had the potential to realize major transitions in evolution of the type that Maynard Smith and Zatmari in their 95 book <coughs> highlighted. So what I'm going to tell you is I've been working on this for about 10 years now. It's in three reviews that I just flies, flash by here if you have an interest in um, checking up on any of this. So the rest will be uh, up-to-date, hopefully, summary. But before I get to the real business, let's again dwell a little bit on what lifetime commitments really are and how strict they are. If you have unicellular eukaryote sacs, that is the first thing that actually involves these kind of commitments. It happened only once, and this is a real strict thing, and it's very simple, right? Here's an egg, here's a sperm. You got fertilization. That's a lifetime commitment. You either perish together or you will make a success of yourself. Once that sperm is in there, it cannot go like, oh, I'd rather have fertilized another egg. Neither can that egg make the argument, ah, I don't think I like this sperm and can I still opt for another possibly better solution. Similar things apply to the origin of eusociality with lifetime committed casts. Here's a lifetime monogamous founding pair of a higher termite, a fungus growing termite. They have made choice only once in their life. Before they have a society, they dig in together and they spend the next 20 or 30 years if they survive in total darkness as a lifetime monogamous pair. Same is true for ants, bees, and wasps, as we'll see, but then they store the sperm. And similar for these farming mutualisms, every ant family farms a single clone of fungal symbionts. Single sperm and egg commit to reproduce, single male and female commit to reproduce, single termite family and fungal clone commit to reproduce. What does that give you? It gives you the well-known life cycle between haploid and diploidy in um, the multicellular eukaryotes. But it gives you something very similar here, right? Because if you have strict lifetime commitments, you have 2N fungus gardens, you have 4N, which is this lifetime mated pair. And once they reproduce, they separate again in 2N type of uh, individuals and basically they're recombined but now at a level of a founding pair in a fungus garden and that is how it extends here. Now I, this is just the, the termites themselves without a fungus garden here is what you get when you add the fungus garden you just add to ploidy and you have them separate to reproduce and recombine again. Even in the ants that are haplodiploid there's very similar logic except that fungus gardens are polyploid and these queens get multiple mated, so you just get higher numbers than the minimally three for a haplodiploid mating pair, but you have the same type of sequence. 
So that is what I believe gave us unconditional somatic altruism <coughs> of the soma serving the germline in our bodies, in plant bodies, in fungal bodies. It gave us unconditional nursing altruism. It gave us unconditional mutualisms in some cases. When this happens, these major conditions, they were always irreversible. They always involved irreversible division of labor, loss of individuality of the constituent parts. They happen repeatedly and independently. At least the last two, this happened only once, but only in some of the lineages. Right? And we'll get back to some examples in a minute. So throughout, I will argue that this form of lifetime commitment was an accessory condition to make these transitions, but not a sufficient one. So time to introduce the social insects to you. You all know them, but I like to sort of capture them in this little functional um, diagram. Um, the ones that have physically differentiated casts, the most advanced ones come in four kinds, the ants, the wasps, the bees, and the termites. So the termites are diplodiploid. These are hymenoptera, haplodiploid. Boy, they basically have different lifestyles. So the ants and termites forage on foot. The wasps and the bees forage on the wing. They are either omnivores or they're vegetarians in one way or the other. But the main thing to keep in mind here is that this state of physically differentiated workers that are lifetime and made it only evolved a handful of times. It's not four, but five actually, because now we know that it happened twice in the corbiculate bees. So the bumblebees and the stingless bees are one group that became obligately eusocial, and the honeybees are another group. So, why is this so fundamental that it is lifetime commitment? Well, there's extreme examples of that. That termite mating pair that I showed you they live the rest of their life in this royal cell, locked away and impossible to get out. The small holes in it where the workers come in to provision them. In the higher termites, sperm have no tails anymore. If you want any evidence of lifetime commitment, absolute absence of sperm competition in any phase of life, this is the evidence. You will never get an organism that loses the swimming capacity of sperm if there is even a trace of sperm competition where speed matter. That's happened in the termites. It sort of proves that we have absolute lifetime monogamy. You die with the only sexual partner you ever have in life. You die very early in most of the cases because it never gets you anywhere, but if you're successful, termite, higher termite colony will perish usually when either the male or the queen dies. They're irreplaceable, okay? So that's a pretty strict form of lifetime commitment. The hymenoptera is exactly the same, except that the males won't survive, but they store sperm in these complex spermatica, sperm storage organs of the females. Females mate, do all the mating, all the sex in their life on a single day when they're still young. They just became sexually mature, they have no colony yet. And the details differ in interesting ways. Is a, at a leaf cut around spermatica, here's a honey bay one. There's interesting glands around that that sort of preserve sperm and keep it alive for up to several decades if you're uh, some ant species, which is a miracle in its own, which I won't have time for today to talk about, but just remember the ants in particular, but also to some extent the bees and the vespine wasps, they invented sperm banks at ambient temperature, and they did so more than 100 million years ago. That's something we still haven't managed to do, right? And they keep that sperm viable for decades. So that is lifetime commitment in the social insects. Now let's look at, take a comparative look at the eukaryote multicellularity situation, the evolution of soma. So here's a tree of life. It's a little outdated now, but it is simple enough to still serve the um, purpose of what I'm going to, the point I'm going to try and drive home. So there's so many protist lineages that all descend from the first 
eukaryote common ancestor. But only some of them evolved obligate multicellular. There's about six, so it's again, it's a handful, just like in the um, eusocial insects. And again, we know them because they make up all visible life around us, right? So plants, three groups of algae, animals, and fungi. Those are the lineages that radiated and filled the planet in terms of what we can see with the bare eyes, not necessarily in biomass. Prokaryotes still have the highest biomass, probably, but this is complex life. And really, the parallel is very striking if you want to take this perspective and consider social insect colonies really to be complex individuals, where the only difference between them and us is that their bodies, but every cell moves around because it has a brain and six legs, and the cells in my body cannot do that. But you get the same sequence, basically, in multicellularity, gametes, differentiating soma, um, meiosis and the next round of reproduction, the thing it repeats itself, etc. And when you just plug in the eusocial insects, you get this lifetime mating event. You get the sterile worker soma, not necessarily fully sterile, but lifetime unmated. You get an next round, etc., etc. So the difference really is that here you have lifetime committed gametes, here you have lifetime committed parents, here all cells are clonal, 100% related, here the average relatedness of those workers to the sisters and the brothers is 50%. It's exactly that in the diploid -diplo termites, it's that on average in the hymenoptera, because hymenopteran sisters are related by 75%, but brothers and sisters by 25%. So if you have an equal sex ratio, you end up exactly at 50%. And as I already hinted at, the beauty of that situation is that when you have predictably constant and maximal relatedness for the level of integration you're talking about, essentially the relatedness variable cancels out of Hamilton's rule. Because 50% here and 50% there makes that cancel. Here you have 100% versus 100%. So that means that all you need to get social evolution to evolve is the benefits of staying together being larger than the costs. Now your immediate reaction will be that's too simple, that cannot be true. But it is actually, there's a twist to that. And I will get to that in a minute. First, I'd like to show you this slide. I think it goes back to Bonner. Dave Quella and John Strassman have used it repeatedly. Even if you compare, say, the multicellular organisms and the social insects by plotting on a double log scale, for the multicellular ones, the number of cells in a body and the number of cell types along the y-axis, and you do that for the use social insects, you take the number of individuals versus the number of cast types, you get two positive correlations there. The only thing I added is these two red lines to show that in fact they are very parallel, they just differ about an order of magnitude and that's not a surprise because it's easier to get division of labor in detail when you are talking clones than when you are talking families. So here's my answer to why it's not in fact, so easy if you have Hamilton's rule reducing to B over C, because you need to think about how, many ev how much evolutionary time you need to make that work. So when relatedness is constant and maximal, either 100% or 50% on average, you don't need much of a benefit over cost ratio. This needs to only be slightly above one. <coughs> But what you need is that it needs to last uninterruptedly for thousands and thousands of generations to make that complete rewiring of developmental programs that make you move from essentially unicellular organism to a multicellular organism that make you move from a primitively eusocial system with helper castes that still are only behavioral to a system where you have physically <coughs> differentiated caste 
that can never mate later in life. And that is, I think, the main reason why it has happened only in some cases, why the ecology that determines the bees and the seas was favorable for enough evolutionary time to make that point of no return. But once it happened, it was very successful, right? And again, this is a well-known picture from, uh, that's been in Bert Holderosen at Wilson's books and goes originally back, I don't know quite how long, but quite a while, but basically making a very simple point that in many terrestrial ecosystems, the biomass of the social insects in total surpasses the biomass of the mammals. And so already said, if you think about the evolution of obligate multicellularity, that's all visible life that we see around us. So we're talking about major things in the history of life here, right? And they only have about 10 origins, five or six for the multicellularity, about five for the social insect with differentiated cost. So just to get you back a little bit, what is the difference then exactly between lifetime commitment that is irreversible and commitments that are conditional? Because there's also a lot of those. And in my opinion, they're not quite kept, kept apart in sufficient ways because they are really different. You have forms of facultative multicellularity. You have forms of non-advanced eusociality. You can call them cooperative breeding, primitive eusociality, anything where helper castes are not in there for life. So they may move on to become breeders themselves later in life. You have lots of promiscuous mutualisms that do not necessarily involve one organism of the host and one of the symbiont genotype. So here's some examples, right? Dictyostelium, slime molds are the sister lineages of the fungi and the animals. They are facultatively eusocial. There's wonderful work having been done on them in conf to understand the conflict and cooperation issues that sort of are at play when they make these asexual fruiting bodies because basically you don't want to end up in the stalk as an amoeba cell because then you won't spread your genes. And in particular, Joan and Dave Strassmann Queller have given us lots of insights. But remember here, all the three variables in Hamilton's rule vary simultaneously. And that's always what you get in these cooperative breeders. These came about by the relatedness term cancelling, and then later on there may be secondary developments where the relatedness kicks in again. This is what I would tend to call a cooperative breeder, even though many people call polistes wasps eusocial. It's not because I deny that they have eusocial nests, but because it's not true that every single individual is lifetime unmated or is lifetime committed to a helper role. Some of them in dominance hierarchies will compete for the breeding positions in their own nest or they may disperse to another nest. And so for them, caste is a flexible phenotypically plastic thing. Here's again the rhizobia mutualism. They are to some extent promiscuous. Some of these nodules may have two or three bacterial strains of rhizobia that compete with each other for the attention of the host plant. And so in a sense, they're less harmonious collaborators because they waste some of their energy in sort of fighting each other rather than serving the host. The fungus farmers that I come back to don't have that. So they're more harmonious type of mutualisms. And again, it's based on lifetime commitment. So keep in mind that the contrast here is, in very general, that However way you turn it, sibling relatedness in the facultative system always remains variable. It's always something that can be favorable for altruism, some phases of the life or under some ecological conditions, but it's not necessarily favorable. And that's why it never allowed physical cost to evolve because you can't have that. Here, you got that because sibling relatedness when they made a transition to physically differentiated caste was predictably 
maximal full set. So let's move to some comparative data. So far it's been simple logic, inference, but this has been put to the test. There's two papers I'd like to quickly summarize. So Bill Hughes and co-workers um, showed a couple of years ago that ancestral monogamy uh, appears to have applied to um, everything that got you social in the Hymenoptera. And then a paper that you probably less familiar with is that something similar has been done for multicellularity quite recently. So those of you working on social insect will have seen this figure from the uh, use it all paper. It basically makes the point that lifetime monogamy is ancestral in the Hymenoptera lineages that later evolved eusociality. Um, these are ants, bees and wasps and this tree only gives you the extent to which multiple queen insemination evolved. So when it's facultative, it's a dotted <laughs> line. When it's obligate, it is a solid red line. And you see that the black lines, that is the monogamy situation, single mated situation is ancestral. So what they didn't, oh yeah, and the termites have been known for a long time to have lifetime monogamy, even in the lower termites as that default setting of starting colonies. But what wasn't sort of made very explicit in this study is actually that even though they could show that single female starting of colonies also was ancestral, that that's actually pretty messy still in the bottom lines here. And when you concentrate on the lineages that got physically differentiated castes that were lifetime unmated, Basically, what the origins you need to look at are higher up in the tree. So here's the corbiculate bees, here is the vespine wasps, and here is the ants, and you need to look at the higher termites because those are the ones that do away with every form of secondary promiscuity. The lower termites don't quite have that because later on in the life cycle, colonies may merge and you may lose the ancestral monogamy. But there's an important take home message here that hasn't been made explicitly in that paper. To the history of eusocial insect biology, there's always been two models that may give you um, eusocial colonies with caste. One is the subsocial model, that is, uh, mothers and siblings, mothers and offspring staying together, and you get sibling care. The others has been, have been called the parasocial roots, or same generation. Uh, females get together. The implication of this is that parasocial systems may be very interesting. They've never given you lifetime commitment enough to make the major transitions to obligate caste. And I've been saying this for a few years now, but it, it's never been written down, I think, in a very explicit manner other places because people still keep this open as a possibility. But since 25, 30 years I've been following this. Not a thread of evidence that actually would support the parasocial route. So I think it's possibly about time we get explicit about that. So here's the situation for multicellularity. Here's the fundamental tree of life at its very root. So when you have prokaryotes, bacteria, and archaea, and where you have the eukaryotes. That's all the rest. Again, focus on two things here. This is what this study by um, this Oxford group did. So some of them have clonal group formation. They start an individual from a single zygote, right? That's the model I've been using, the subsocial route, if you want. But there's also ways to get group started in the parasocial way. So you have an aggregation of things. Dictyostelium is an example of that, right? So you get an aggregation of things. They may be clonal. They may also be more genetically variable. And then all they did, apart from plotting these black and gray dots here, is say, well, we give bold lines for those that evolved m obligate multicellularity, and we give thin lines, I think it is, for, yeah for facultative multicellular. And the upshot's very clear. So you could never 
evolve obligate multicellularity apparently unless you start individuals from a single zygote. Right? So non-clonal origins produced facultative multicellularity in about the same rate as that the clonal ones produce facultative multicellularity, but only the single zygote starters are responsible for obligate multicellularity. And note that they have about nine transitions here, where I only had five or six, six I think, because they acknowledge that a few bacteria have done that in a similar way, but again, from single cell origin. The clonality, single zygote commitment was apparently also here an accessory but not sufficient condition to get obligate multicellularity. Very similar to what I believe is true for the eusocial insect. So let me use the last bit of my time to take you to that highest level, to mutualisms, to cooperation. Very tight cooperation between totally different organisms. And remember, we're going to do that again from this perspective. So it's, I'm not going to talk to you about facultative ones where everything stays variable, but about these things that imply single individuals or single clones from both parties so that whatever propagation they realize of their offspring, they'll always be Bill, will be full siblings. And we're familiar with that, right? Normally, when we think of these endosymbiotic, of, or these symbiotic commitments, we talk about endosymbiotic. So it's very clear that there is a very good reason for our mitochondria, that we domesticate it, not our cells, but the very first eukaryote cell, the ancestor of everything eukaryote managed to do that. But they're single clones, right? Again, for the same logic, if we would have two lineages of mitochondria in our cells, they wouldn't necessarily serve us maximally well. They would spend some of their time competing about who makes it to the X for the females. And they would probably be very unfriendly to keep any males alive as well, because they would be even more of a waste of investment and energy when there was two lineages of mitochondria involved and when there's only one. So we're familiar with this. Lifetime commitment again between a single zygote for the nuclear genes and a single clone of mitochondria. That's what builds multicellular organisms. But I promised you to take you into the realm of the eusocial insects that farm fungi because they're spectacular beasts. We've been working on them for a long time and think made some progress in understanding them. So just a few slides about the size of societies we're talking about, right? Atan ants is an atta colony, the pinnacle, the top of that evolutionary tree. Here's a man drawn in. He has hundreds of fungus gardens. Here's their compost recycling system. They are spectacularly complex and interesting society. Yet, they all derive not from a single mating pair that stays together for life as in the termites, but this single queen that sits on top of one of those fungus gardens. Half of her abdomen is the sperm storage organ. In there is the sperm that she obtained on a single day early in life and that she will maintain for a couple of decades. That's how long they live. They're infamous defoliators. You probably all know that. Um, and the only other system that rivals that in complexity among the social insects is the fu fungus farming termites, the macrotermitini. Again, some of them, particularly the genus macrotermis, impressive societies of a uh, similar size as Atta, somewhere in there, a fungus garden system that is different from that of the Atta ants in every conceivable detail. It's a different fungus, it's a different substrate because these are decomposers and not uh, fresh vegetation forages. But again, 
you have that single germline system there, but now it is that queen and here's her mate. When they had their nuptial flight, they were the same size. But as her role is to be this enormously sophisticated egg-laying machine, she swell up to these kind of dimensions. So you have a germline here. You have a germline here. And you have one clone of symbionts. So we study these ants for about over 20 years now, but I had the good fortune to have people joining me later on to develop that fungus growing termite program, which really made us see, after considering all the details that are different, what they have in common that makes sense. They have that form of organization. And this is what they have in common. Ants and termite families commit for life to a single fungus garden clone. So if you take repeated samples of the same fungus garden, no matter whether it's ants or termites, you get identical genotypes. But it doesn't mean, like in human farming, that it's clones all over. Every colony has a different fungal symbiont. So there's lots of variation in the population. And that makes the system very robust, because you can't have diseases sweeping through and killing off everything. So we have a situation here also of a lifetime matrimony between each farming family of ants or termites and a single symbiote that's like a mitochondria. And that means that both the family and the symbiote basically leave highly related siblings so they keep being confirmed in their commitment to reproductive altruism even though the ants, for example, have later evolved multiple queen mating. So again, the parallel is quite striking. So the ants inherit their symbiont vertically from their mother colony. So all they need to do is prevent secondary invasions. If some kind of stupid worker would pick up a fungal clone from a neighboring nest and carry it in and say, oh, is this a good invention? We published ten years ago and repeated that recently that there's all sorts of incompatibility mechanisms in place for that not to happen um, because basically both the ants and the resident fungus protect their monopoly so they kill off anything that comes in secondary. But the challenge was to show in the termites how that worked because here we have a situation of horizontal acquisition so a founding termite colony picks up its symbiont from the environment and likely starts with a huge diversity. So how is it possible that when they're big enough that we can sample them, that we find a single clone <coughs> of fungus garden? So Dürer um, did the decisive experiments to prove this. So he started out considering, I think this was 50 colonies, sampling the, the fungal clones. This is the diversity. 48 of them had a different clone. There's only two of them that had the same. So huge variation in termitomyces symbionts at a population level. But then the next thing he was doing is trying to mimic what the transmission mode is within colonies. And now I need to take you to a little bit of natural history. So this is how a fungus garden in termites is built. So what the termites eat are these nodules that look like this. They are asexual spores. So when they get their, eat their plant material that they foraged for, they also eat nodules, they mix that in, and the spores survive gut passage, so when they deposit the next layer of their fungus garden, it is inoculated with whatever grew on the older layer. So Durham simulated that in the lab by basically using five different strains together on an agar plate and then harvesting that after round after the other and basically he started out giving one clone a 50% share and the other four clones got 12.5% each. And then he was looking at what are the frequencies would change of representation. And you can see in the histogram 
there, even though there is variation among clones, that the total result was really very significant. A clone that has the majority will increase its majority in the next round. And if that happens, you have a process, what we call positive frequency dependence, so it takes only a little time until you have one clone left. And that clone will also be uninvadable by secondary clones because of this positive frequency dependent situation. And here is the diagram that actually illustrates that. So here's an agar plate where you have five clones in equal frequency. Here's an agar plate where there's only one clone. If there is lots of genetic variation, every little mycelium will try to make a nodule. So you get more of them but they cannot have optimal division of labor. So in a clonal patch, you get fewer nodules, but they have lots more asexual spores per nodule. So the balance of these C2 things is that, in fact, um, this passes on lots more asexual spores to the next layer of fungus garden than the left situation. <coughs> Only clonal gardens have proper pr and productive division of labor, and that is what stabilizes this mutualism. Now, a few more minutes, very quickly, to try and address the question, how universal is this commitment for the sake of full siblings rule? And that brings me to the vertebrates. Um, I gave you the logic of strict lifetime monogamy. Die with the only sexual partner you ever have, not only you as an individual, but everybody else in the population following the same logic. No vertebrate has ever been monogamous enough to evolve <laughs> lifetime differentiated castes. I think uh, we all appreciate that that is true because we know the most used social mammal or vertebrae is the naked mole rat. And even there, when you go to the nitty gritty of what governs their social systems, you will discover in the literature that naked mole rat colonies, even though almost all individuals are helpers for life and die being sterile helpers, some actually will become dispersers and some will take over the colony when one of the breeders dies. That's m comparable much more to polistes than it is to an ant or particular termite system. So the colony life of naked mole rats is used social. The individual commitment isn't quite 100%. And that means they don't have differentiated castes for life. Let's look at the comparative breeding birds and mammals. Again, you never find strict lifetime monogamy. But we do find various degrees of serial monogamy. Birds vary from totally promiscuous systems to pretty monogamous systems, although never as monogamous as they are in the used social insect. And there is enormous amount of data on them. They come in huge diversity. So uh, Charlie Conwallis and co-workers again at Oxford uh, try to put this idea to the test and see whether even though monogamy is not strict, what it would still predict that you would get helpers at the nest the more full siblings they would take care of. So you go to a cycle of say here you have monogamy um, and then you can hypothesize that breeds cooperative breeding but then when somehow some other force makes the parents more promiscuous you would tend to lose that and get to independent breeding again and then again when something makes the parents more monogamous and you get the cycle. So what happens of course is that in monogamous systems, all offspring are full siblings. As soon as you get promiscuity to kick in, part of them become half siblings. So the incentive for inclusive fitness reasons to um, help raising them for all the siblings should be less. So here's the data that came out of that. Um, indeed, as predicted, uh, promiscuity levels in cooperative breeders are on average lower than in non-cooperative breeders. This is comparing species and this is comparing populations within the same species that had different degrees of promiscuity. You get more noise, but the trend is in the same predicted direction. 
The beauty of working with birds is that you have enormous amounts of comparative data. Here's again the total phylogeny that fed that. Um, but now the red lines basically indicate cooperative breeding that evolved multiple times and the black ones are solitary breeding. When you have a big data set like this, there are computer programs now that basically can make you derive causality. So you can, by following the branches backwards, you can figure out what was likely to come first, reductions in promiscuity or helping behavior, or was it the other way around? And it was very clear that, in fact, you first needed to reduction of promiscuity for some ecological reason, and then you got helpers. So if you move from cooperative to non-cooperative, that followed a change in promiscuity upwards. When you had a change in promiscuity downwards, so become more monogamous, you tended to get the helpers at the nest. So again, consistent with the same logic, but not as extreme. Tim Klottenrock and co-workers did something similar for the mammals later on. Here they used reproductive skew, and you get the same kind of thing. Um, here you have the cooperative breeders uh, and the other breeders. Very high skew, that means a single dominant breeder, both for the males and the females. In the cooperative breeders, in the non-cooperative breeders, you get much uh, lower uh, reproductive <coughs> skew. And that also was reflected in the tenure of the dominant male at the nest. So I'm almost at the end, but I would like to leave you with, uh, now that we've moved up uh, towards the vertebrates, a little thing about commitment in analogies in humans. I know Randy's done a book on that at some point early in his life, so he may not disagree, not agree with me, but I tried to summarize in a single slide how we consider commitments. We have them, and they're either personal, and they involve multiple mutual obligations. We tend to write contracts about them, explicit statements, but in almost all cases, these contracts also have opt-out clauses, for, even for compensation. And that's interesting. So again, it illustrates we're not nearly as close uh, to lifetime commitments as the social insects are, even though some religious sects have tried to persuade us that we should be moving in that direction. We also have interactions between collectives. That's contract between companies or treaties between nations. And they may work, they may hold, they may also break down, particularly if you consider this happy situation we had only a few years ago. This doesn't need further comment. Um, again, the social insects have these two, right? Personal and collective um, interactions that involve contracts, the fungus farming ones you can call collective ones. The essential thing to remember when you look at this, this is our world around us. Potential conflicts always remain. That's why we have opt-out clauses, but also because we're humans in civilized nations. Individual rights and personal freedom should always be protected and prevail, and that is why we go to all this paperwork. There's no individual rights in an ant colony or a termite colony, right? Neither are there for the somatic cells in my body, right? So that's a crucial difference that sets humans apart from anything else in nature. So here's this three take home message on my last slide. The points I've been trying to make is really to go back to basics of how we understand social biology in general and to make the point that I think lifetime commitments are an overlooked and very crucial point to take into consideration because they've been driving major transitions. They're rare but very powerful mechanisms and they eliminate most conflict, sexual conflict in particular, and they encourage a type of loyalty, both between the parents and between the siblings, that is so high that in some of these lineages, if it lasts long enough, they will either produce obligate somatic cells or obligate physically differentiated worker. 
when these commitments happen and deliver their consistent synergistic benefit, see how freedom disappears. Sex and society become completely separate. Now, there's no way you can imagine that in humans, can we? So these two, these termite male and queen, do all the mate choice of their life before they have a society. Same for that atta queen that gets inseminated for life. When she leaves the colony she grew up in, before she'll settle down and try to found her own colony. She will never remate later in life. So individual freedom is lost. And it's really obvious. We knew this all the time, right? We, we wouldn't sort of tend to give rights to our somatic cells. But realize it's a price for ultimate harmonious cooperation. And that is what humans try to do in a uniquely different manner. Right? We try to do this without inclusive fitness maximization. Thank you. So that wouldn't leave us with a very friendly and comfortable society. But it also illustrates the challenges we're up to because nature hasn't given us any model to do that. That's it. Um, acknowledgements of the major bodies that funded us and I'd be most happy to take questions as far as we have time left. Thank you very much. freedom to reproduce. You've lost the freedom to take up any other role than which is predetermined for you by your developmental program. It's like a muscle or cell in my body. It's only raison d'etre, it's only reason to exist, is to make my limbs move. It, it cannot make me think. Right? So the main difference between you social insects with physically differentiated casts is that that totipotent individuality has gone lost. And there's very interesting analogies again with stem cells, right? They come in all sorts of degrees of freedom, right? You have the totipotent ones early in embryonic growth, then you get the somewhat less totipotent one, multipotent I think is the word, and then for, for specific organs. Every organ has them, right? But they become increasingly restricted in what they still can do and what is out of reach. So it's that kind of freedom, the freedom to reproduce, but also if you're a non-reproducer, the, the, the kind of spectrum of options that are open to you. Does that help? <clears throat> of course, you very clearly described what is uh, necessary mm -hmm. or required to evolve your sociality, but you didn't say, but well, you think there's a general uh, pattern that makes it sufficient or that makes this transition to you sociality. Do you think there's something like that? No, I doubt there is actually, because the B and C in Hamilton is ecology. And, and that's very idiosyncratic, right? I mean, we don't know where the first ant evolved, where the first higher termite evolved. But they wouldn't have that same conditions. And one is a decomposer, the other was a, a predatory wasp-like creature. So I don't think we should even try to predict that because it, I think it's a dead alley. It has some interesting consequences, though, that I've tried to write a little about in these reviews, that we should be a bit careful when, for example, we use genomic data to predict what kind of genes have been involved in eusociality because um, there is this model out there, it's called the toolkit model, that seems to suggest that it must be similar genes, if not the same genes. And I would tend to be skeptic about that, exactly for the reason that you're mentioning. If, if we had lifetime monogamy as, as a necessary but not sufficient condition. The sufficient condition was idiosyncratic, was somewhere totally uncompared. So then I would say, yes, of course some genes will get involved, like genetic, because it tends to have to do with ovaries. But as soon as you're beyond that, I can see no reason whatsoever 
why the eusocial phenotype should have been produced by the same genes or even similar genes. Right? So that is one of the consequences, I would say, of, ex of answering your question in that way. No, we can't predict that. That's why we should also not pretend we can predict which genes were necessary to do that <coughs> rewiring process towards irreversible lifetime unmated cars. Note also I use lifetime unmated, not sterile. Because that unites the termites and the ants. It's only because of haplodiploidy that lifetime unmatedness doesn't mean sterility in the hymenoptera. But that's really not the issue. So when you look go from the lower to the higher termites, there is this very clear irreversible cast trajectory. If you are a helper, you're a helper for life, you will never get a mate. I think that is the crucial thing, not sterility. That is a hymenopteran idiosyncrasy, which gives us lots of interesting dynamics to work with, about relatedness, asymmetries, and the variation, all that. But for the origin, I don't think sterility by itself is, is a crucial uh, variable. It's lifetime and maybe. It seems like with your emphasis on the importance of this lifetime and maybe this makes me, why do you think so many of the ants and bees that have evolved multiple mating, multiple fabrices haven't lost these are all these sociality? Yeah. These are all secondary development. Exactly. Because they're secondary, they could not make your sociality get lost. Because your sociality, <coughs> I think, and the evidence is getting pretty good, that evolved with lifetime monogamy, full sig across the board. That got the rewiring of cast phenotypes done. But once that was irreversible, the system could start elaborating on that. Right? We see that. See multiple mating pop up in some lineages, either facultative or obligate. We understand obligate multiple mating reasonably well now. Honeybees, army ants, antines, pogos. It always seemed to have something to do with more efficient division of labor, more robustness towards the disease, and these kind of things. We don't understand facultative multiple mating. It's evolved multiple times. It doesn't seem to have obvious advantages. And, and my current hypothesis is basically maybe facultative multiple mating is just a compensation for failed first matings or something like that. And you have some kind of a mixed ESS. So you can both be a fit colony if you have a single mated mother, and you can have a fit colony if your mom made it in two or three minutes. Because if they weren't, on average, equal, you would see a shift in that system. But neither do I think facultative multiple mating is a precursor directly of obligate multiple mating. There seem to be two different trajectories that are being selected for different reasons. Polygony is also a derived characteristic in the end. That's been known for a long time. I think Bert nailed that down for the first time. Yeah, it has ecological benefits. But it's very interesting to see that it's very widespread in the ants. It's absolutely indeterminate. It's never obligate in the bees and the wasps. So there's interesting further things to say about that, which I don't have time for because I would see like Randy get this discussion go on for an hour. <laughs> Let's have one more question and then wrap it up. Uh, I, it's more a comment or something mm -hmm. because I think what is really crucial for your model, you fix the relatedness of the helpers, basically, right? So that that's a long time commitment where you say there's no variation and so you get that settled first. first. Right. You get that settled first because then, then you can have your evolution basically for non reproduction, right? In in the helper systems. Because that's the second point which you don't have by lifetime commitment first. It's not that the offspring then can go on, oh I can that's right. cheat, right? There's no way. So so the long time commitment itself sets a state. I think that's what you say it's essential but not kind of sufficient for that. Yeah. And so that second step, I think that's where we don't understand what other uh, kind of factors yeah. and we're and we're in. We can't that. understand that because it's it right. it's, it's, it is, I mean, you can individually, yeah. hopefully, yes. but, but not as a general rule. No. Okay. 
All right. Thank you very much.